Namaste, and welcome to the latest episode of Yoga Vasishta. So we're going to skip chapters four through nine because it's mostly narrative and there isn't really any substantial spiritual content uh, in terms of the teaching of Yoga Vasishta. So you can read those on your own for continuity and context. And if you haven't already downloaded the text, there's a download link in the video description just below. So please use that, download the link, and read the background, because that will give you additional context to understand the meaning. So let's take a look at chapter 10. Thus sent by the king, the chamberlain went to the inner apartment. After some moments, he returned and informed the king, O oh, sire, Rama, whose arms have crushed all his foes, remains wrapped in thoughts in his room, like a bee closed in a lotus at night. He said that he is coming in a moment, but he is so lost in his lonely meditation that he likes nobody to be near him. Well, this is a classic description of depression, isn't it? I want to be alone. <laughs> so what is depression, really? Of course, psychologists have all kinds of stuff to say about it, which most of which I don't buy. I've been depressed, and I was even one time uh, tried to take uh, antidepressants, Prozac. It was horrible because it takes away all feelings, makes you emotionally numb. I'd rather be depressed. So what is depression really? I think, in my own experience, and especially in the context of Yoga Vasishta, depression is the first symptom of impending enlightenment. Because what does it mean? Huh? In plain human terms, it means, I have a problem I can't solve. I have a desire I can't satisfy. I'm running up against the limits of my mind to understand life, to uh, change things the way I want them, to make my life successful, to be happy. Huh? So I can't solve this problem. So what happens? What does my mind do? The mind is very tricky. It puts up this emotional smoke screen of doom and gloom. Oh, everything's useless, you know. <laughs> what was that in Hitchhiker's Guide? The, the paranoid android. <laughs> that everything is, is terrible, everything is bad, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, I just want to curl up and die. Oh, poor me. Huh? What is that? Lamenting for the ego. So this lamentation happens when we realize that we don't really understand life. We don't really get what it's all about. We have failed in some way to attain our goals, to solve our problems, to get our life the way we want it. And so, of course, the chief suspect is the mind because the mind is the tool that we use to approach and manipulate life, isn't it? So if we're failing, if we're feeling we're not making it, we're losing, the mind is the chief suspect. So what does the mind do? It does what any suppressive person or any sociopath would do. It puts the blame back on you. It says, oh, you screwed up. You're a bad person. You should feel bad about this. Huh? Why? So that you don't look into it too deeply. So that you don't uh, examine the role of the mind in this situation. Because maybe, maybe the mind itself 
is at fault. The lotus-eyed Rama appears dejected ever since he has come back from his pilgrimage in company with the Brahmins. When asked to perform his daily rites, he sometimes discharges them with a sad face, and at other times he wholly dispenses with them. He is adverse, O Lord, to bathing, to worshipping the gods, to the distribution of alms, and to his meals also. Even when we trouble him to eat, he does not take his food with a good relish. He's definitely depressed. <laughs> no energy, isn't it? Isn't it? When you get depressed, it's like you just don't have any incentive to do anything. Why? Because everything that I have tried so far has failed. So what happened? Rama went on this pilgrimage and he visited all the holy places. There's an extensive description of it in the text. And when he came back, suddenly he was plunged into this funk. Why? Because he saw so much of life that he had never seen before cooped up in the palace. It's very similar to the story of the Buddha, Sakyamuni Buddha was the prince, regent. He was going to be made the king. And so the astrologers, when he was born, he said, either this boy will become a great king or he will become a great renunciant and give up the world. And of course the father was, no, no, <laughs> that can't happen. I need a son to succeed me as the king. And actually it's for the benefit of the populace that the king should have a clear successor. That means there's a more stable government and peace in the kingdom and so on. So to do his job, the king needed a successor, but he tried to keep Buddha in the palace atmosphere and never let him out. But one time he got out and what did he see? Suffering. So similarly, Rama toured all the provinces, went to all the holy places, all over India, up and down. And he saw so many things that he had never seen before. And in the company of the Brahmins, well, of course, they're going to explain to him, there's suffering in life. Not everyone is as fortunate as you are. Some people have bad karma, and so they have to go through all kinds of tribulation. So this is the average lot in life. You are in an exceptional position. You're very wealthy. You have a, a enlightened fa family. Uh, your father is a great king. His friends are all the great sages and so on. So when he came back, he started to consider all this. After all the um, confusion and drama of travel, is finished. Uh, by the way, travel is a wonderful thing because it detaches you from your ordinary roles and it puts you in the role of a spectator. You're there sitting in the train or the bus or whatever it is and just watching the world go by. Uh, you can't interact. You can't interfere. You can only observe. And so what do you see? You see people, little snapshots of people's lives who you would never ordinarily get to meet or interact with. And it's wonderfully objectifying. You get to see things in such a clear way because you are not an actor in that person's space. So you get to see them with their uncensored expressions on their faces. You get to see them worried about their kids. Uh, uh, working hard at their jobs or traveling themselves, uh, going here and there on bikes and motorbikes and walking, carrying loads and stuff like this. You get to see them at work struggling for money. So you get to see life as it really is. And this is a great education, especially if like Rama, you've lived kind of a sheltered life. O oh, King, his aversion to clothing, conveyance, food, and presence indicates that he is following the line of life 
led by wandering ascetics. He lives alone in a lonely place and neither laughs nor sings nor cries aloud from a sense of his indifference to them. Seated in the lotus posture with folded legs, he stays with a distracted mind, reclining his cheek on his left palm. He assumes no pride to himself and does not wish for the dignity of sovereignty. He is neither elated with joy nor depressed by grief or pain. We do not know where he goes, what he does, what he desires, what he meditates upon, or from where or when he comes and what he follows. So up until then, everybody felt that they knew Rama. He's the prince regent, the eldest of the three brothers. He's going to be crowned king. No problem, right? So he was doing his duties, following all the instructions. Very good. Now he comes back from this long travel, long pilgrimage, and he's plunged into thought. This is life? This is the average person's existence? These are the people that I have to rule, that I have to be responsible for? And under my responsibility, they're going to live such uh, deeply unsatisfying lives? You see, Rama was a very high-minded individual. He was given the best education possible at the time. So when he saw all this going on in the world, he was dismayed. He was like, my God, this is what life is really like for most people? He was shocked. Outside of the sheltered environment of the palace, huh, with the harem and the dancing girls and all of the great uh, politics going on and, and so much drama, huh, royal activities of pastimes of sovereignty. Huh? Suddenly he was out there in life, surrounded just by a, a small escort of Brahmins and probably some soldiers and guards. And he got to see life as it really is. It was a shock. Now what? What is this life really about? So he lost interest in all the usual royal amusements. He was thinking. He was turning it over in his mind. And he was starting to realize life sucks. <laughs> Ordinary human life on planet Earth really does suck. Because... Nothing is certain. Every effort meets with resistance, even from one's own friends. Huh? Every desire is likely to fail, or actually certain to fail in the long run. You may get what you want, but it's only temporary. And even then, it's not perfect. And sooner or later, time is going to take it away. And there you are again. So this is the human condition. Rama had been exposed to it really in depth for the first time. And now he's trying to understand what to do. He lectures his companions and friends saying, do not set your mind to sensual enjoyments which are only pleasing for the time being. He has no affection for the richly adorned women of the harem, but rather looks upon them as the cause of destruction presented before him. He often sings in plaintive notes how his life is being spent in vain cares, estranged from those of the easily attainable state of heavenly bliss. Should some courtier speak of his being an emperor one day, he smiles at him as upon a raving madman, and then remains silent as one distracted in his mind. He does not pay heed to what is said to him, nor does he look at anything presented before him. He hates to look upon even the most charming of things. As it is imaginary and unreal to suppose the existence of an ethereal lake or a lotus growing in it, so it is false to believe the reality of the mind and its conceptions. Saying so, Rama marvels at nothing. 
This is classic. Huh? He has ceased to believe in the promises of the mind. The mind is saying, you are this, and this is yours, and this guy is your uh, dependent. You can order him, you can do anything you want. Huh? You can possess this, you can enjoy that, you can go here and there, and you can satisfy your desires. But the mind is a cheating rascal. The mind says, you can get pleasure out of these things. But what does it lead to? Nothing but suffering. And so Rama, beautifully, he says, do not set your mind to sensual enjoyments, which are only pleasing for the time being. In other words, these pleasures have a beginning and an end. So they're really non-existent. Real existence is eternal. And this is what he got from his pilgrimage to the holy places. There is an eternal existence. There is that which has neither beginning nor end. But here in human life, we're separated from it. We're separated by the mind. The mind is the seat of the ego. And the ego is the sense of individual existence that I am a self, I am a being different from all others and different from God as well. And I exist completely separately. I have my own activities, my own ideas, my own desires, and so on. So in this way, it builds fences around us. Huh? And then we wonder why we feel lonely, why we feel detached from all existence disconnected, alienated, huh? even from ourselves. There's a wonderful word for that, anomi. Anomi is a feeling of being alienated even from oneself. So in this way, of course, he's feeling downcast. He's feeling very thoughtful and looking at all things as if they're useless, worthless, junk. Huh? And his conclusion is so wonderful. It is false to believe the reality of the mind and its conceptions. In other words, the mind is just a picture show. Huh? It's a magic show. It's a movie projected on the screen of consciousness. It's not real. And the proof that it's not real is when we go to sleep at night, and the whole world, the body, the ego, everything disappears. And it's replaced by another world, another body, another ego, another identity in the dreams. And then we go through some dreams and all this crazy stuff happening. And then that world also disappears and we're in deep sleep and there's nothing. Zero. And in that state, there is no mind. But we're unconscious, so we don't notice it. We come out again into dreams, go through some more illusory capers, <laughs> and then we wake up. And what do we wake up to? The mind. Good morning, you're Mr. Ananda, Dave Ananda, yes, get up and have breakfast and go do your thing for the day. So the mind is full of desires and the desires are for the self. And the self is the ego, the one who is separate from everything. So here we are trying to reach across this, this vast distance between ourselves and the rest of everything trying to satisfy these desires, these illusory dreams, and failing again and again and again. And so after a while, the depression, if we're intelligent, now stupid people, it doesn't happen so often, but to intelligent people, the depression will kick in. And it's like, wait a minute, 
I've been following these desires and listening to this mind all this time and everything I've tried has eventually failed. What is the meaning of this? What could it possibly signify? What am I doing wrong? See? Well, what you're doing wrong is believing in the mind. <laughs> and this is really the statement of the fundamental teaching of Yoga Vasishta. Don't trust the visions of the mind. It's pictures of the world. It's ideas about your identity. It's plans and schemes to get this and that so that you'll be happy. Well, even if you get this and that, you won't be happy. You'll only be happy when you get in touch with the self, the real self. You know, I, I know I'm running long here, but way back seven years ago, in the beginning of this channel, the first series was Being in the World, really the first one that we did. And that series is about the conflict between the self that the world tells you you are and the self that you feel yourself to be within. That I want to do this and that, A, B, C, D. Huh? And life is telling me I have to do X, Y, Z, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to have to work. I don't want to have to put up with all these jerks. <laughs> huh? But life is telling me that I have to. Society is telling me I have to. So there's a conflict. I want to do this, and the world is telling me to do that. That is the beginning. You see? That is where it starts. And because at that point, we had given up all faith-based paths, and we decided we're only going to follow the path of experience, experiential, uh, phenomenology. In other words, we, we don't believe anything unless we observe it for ourselves. So from that point of view, now we have evolved through so many studies of different things to the point where we're saying this is the ultimate statement of the same problem. We are believing in the mind and the mind is deceiving us. And so to see the truth, to experience actual reality, to become who we really are, we have to overcome this illusory mind. And so that's what this whole series is going to be about, exactly how to do that. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Arunachala Shivam Yidam